<laughs> Greetings, everyone. This is Jackie Lupman. And I am Baba Lupman. And welcome to another episode of The Imprint of Imperialism in Lupman Nation here on Black Power Media. Still the most dangerous show on social media. Still. On the most dangerous platform, which is Black Power Media. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So sorry for the little delay and the weird audio. There's always some stuff that we got to work out yeah. <laughs> with these issues. But listen, we we hope that you are having a good uh, Friday, that your week was good. We're glad to be here. We are very happy to be able uh, to put this uh, uh, show on for you tonight because the topics we're going to talk about are extremely important. So listen, before we do anything else, like this video, yep. share, invite your friends. Uh, look, let's talk about what's going on uh, on the continent of Africa and what these things mean to us. And to be with us to have this conversation, we are extremely happy to be joined by our friend and our comrade and our colleague, Milton <laughs> Potty, the hey, there he is. Uh, uh, publisher of Black Star News. Welcome, Brother Milton. We are so very glad that you could join us again for another episode of The Imprints of Imperialism. Yes, it's always my pleasure. Great. We got a lot, as we always do. We got so much ground to cover because so much goes on on the continent when we're not looking, yes, <laughs> right? When we're right. paying attention to what's going on uh, uh, here uh, on on this continent, we, we don't pay enough attention to what's going on on the African continent, uh, on the African continent, and it is all connected to what's going on here. So what, what are we starting off with today? Well, Milton, we're going to start off today with um, The Hague once again. Hmm. Uh, prosecuting another um, African. Uh, we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. But Dominique Gwen, I believe, uh, I hope I pronounced that name right, right. Um, who they called the for former Ugandan child soldier jailed for war crimes. Um, he was sentenced to 25 years um, uh, by the Hague um, for um, crime, war crimes against um, the Ugandan people. Um, so, uh, Again, this uh, could you give us a little background, uh, Milton, on this guy and 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 yeah. his organization and 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 and, and let us know and and, and let's talk about the Hague and and their their um the see that this their seemingly um uh, uh way of always prosecuting African. But anyway, let's talk about this guy. Right. Okay. Very good. Uh, as always, thank you for having me. Absolutely. I always, I always feel so elated when I'm discussing the continent with comrades in spirit, you know? Good. Um, so Dominic Ongwen belonged to what was called the Lord's Resistance Army. And the true criminal that needs to be locked up somewhere is actually the person that helped to create and build the Lord's Resistance Army, which is the US World Bank and IMF back the dictator of Uganda of 35 years. So when General Yoweri Museveni came to power in 1986, he soon launched a campaign of retribution, particularly in parts of Uganda where he sensed he did not have support. So that retribution ignited a number of rebellions. The first was led by a woman named Alice Laquena. And people can Google and look her up, but she was demonized in Western media as some sort of like a crazy witch. And that's the term that Western media like. And General Museveni knows how to play on these stereotypes. And for that reason, that rebellion was not well covered. The issues, why is a, an African woman leading men under arms to fight against a regime? Because the men had not stepped forward at that point. Mm. And she, she could no longer bear watching 
the dictatorship of Museveni, killing innocent Ugandans, men, women, children. So she took it upon herself and said she was willing to lead them because she was in touch with her African spirituality and that would guide them to victory. And the young men actually believed her and she defeated the government forces in several battles and went all the way to Uganda's major city of Jinja. And that's when the tide really turned around and ultimately she was defeated and she was exiled. She was not actually captured. She managed to uh, escape and go to Kenya. Out of that initial rebellion, a young individual named Joseph Korn, who once was actually an altar boy in a church. So this was a person who was actually religious and he took it upon himself to continue that rebellion. Now, Museveni continued with the same tactic of demonizing the Lord's Resistance Army. And the Lord's Resistance Army was actually also, at one point, rejected by people in that part of Uganda because they'd had enough of the fighting between the National Army and between the rebels. And that's when both the government army of Museveni and the Lord's Resistance Army <coughs> started, bless you brother, started, started recruiting young people to fight this battle that is now being controlled by adults on both sides. You know, you had uh, the National Army of Uganda under Museveni and the Lord's Resistance Army under Joseph Korn, getting children involved in this conflict, getting children to commit horrific atrocities. And Dominic, and when happened to be one of these child soldiers mm. who, who was recruited. Now, here's the difference. So, Museveni is the president, the dictator of Uganda. So, he has, he has access to the International Criminal Court. And he invites the International Criminal Court to prosecute the leadership of the Lord's Resistance Army. And the ICC, which of course, as you pointed out, is a Western instrument. And since Museveni is a Western puppet, they go after the leadership of the Lord's Resistance Army and ignore all the crimes committed by General Museveni. Mm. In fact, by the time he invited the ICC to prosecute uh, the LRA, Museveni had already committed the crimes in the Congo, invading the Congo multiple times. In fact, the Congo had already been awarded damages by the International Court of Justice, which deals with the civil cases between nations, as opposed to the ICC, which deals with criminal prosecution. Mm -hmm. The ICJ had awarded the Congo six to $10 billion in reparations for war crimes committed by Museveni's army in the Congo raping women, massacres, burning people in their homes, plundering resources from the Congo, right? In fact, it's an active case. As we speak right now, two weeks ago, they were meeting in The Hague <laughs> to, to discuss, you know, Congo wants to get his money now. So mm -hmm. we, can, we, we can discuss that in another episode because mm -hmm. it will take up time today. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so, so there's a very interesting article in the Wall Street Journal from June 8, 2006. Mm -hmm. That article said even the prosecutors at the ICC were shocked that the prosecutor general at that time, the chief prosecutor, his name was Moreno Ocampo. He's uh, originally Argentinian. Mm -hmm. That he was posed for a photograph together with General Museveni, just for PR photograph. And why was that? because the ICC at that time also wanted to open up a separate investigation of General Museveni <laughs> for the crimes he committed in the Congo 
for which the Congo had already been awarded monetary damages, reparations. So they said, how could you as a chief prosecutor be standing for a PR photo with somebody whom we might end up indicting and prosecuting for the crimes that his army committed in the Congo? Okay, so what did that article say? The article said Museveni called Kofi Annan, who at the time was the Secretary General Secretary of the United Nations, and asked him to block that criminal investigation. Wow. <laughs> so the article said, uh, Kofi Annan told Museveni, said, no, I don't have the powers to block this investigation. But the fact that uh, Joseph Cohen was indicted Dominique Nguyen was indicted, and all these other folks were indicted, and Dominique has now been uh, tried and sentenced. And the fact that Museveni has not been indicted means there was a powerful country that stepped in and blocked that investigation. And the only country that has the power to do that and the incentive to do it would be the United States to protect their puppet, General Museveni. And that is the big story that's being ignored. So the story now becomes Dominique Nguyen, yes. when in fact the biggest criminal in Uganda and East and Central Africa is General Yoweri Museveni. But you have the corporate media spin. We are thankful to have an outlet such as this one where we can actually present the facts and people that doubt it can go back and look. I gave you the date of the Wall Street Journal article and everybody can do their research, you know? You know what? Milton, I'm so glad you gave us this context uh, because one of our, our viewers, Bosco777, asked, wasn't the U.S. training and selling arms to Uganda at the time as well? Um, and that's certainly a question I would love for you to address, but I just want to make clear that the person who we're talking about who was just sentenced uh, by uh, uh, the, the Hague, uh, Dominic Ongwin, he did... Um, he was a child soldier himself. Yes, he was. And he did recruit, not recruit, because that's not really what he did. He kidnapped children right. and enlisted them into the uh, Lord's Resistance Army to fight right. against uh, Museveni and his forces. Am I getting right. that right? Absolutely, right. Okay, so so the what? crimes that he is he was on trial for, he absolutely committed them, right? I don't want anyone to think right. that we're excusing no, of course the not. actions of, of, uh, uh, of uh, I have to get his name right, Dominic on oh, them. We're right. not. Absolutely. And that's why we gave the historical context. Right. People can Google Museveni and child soldiers, and they will see Museveni posing with children that he recruited into the army as young mm -hmm. as 11 years old, 12 years old, 13 years old. So why has he not been charged? Think about that. Right. You know? So the selective prosecution is meant to divert attention away from the real story. Oh, we have the bandit now. We tried the bandit. We sentenced the bandit. The true bandit is sitting in state house in Uganda. All these crimes would not have been committed anyway had it not been for the atrocities initiated by General Museveni himself. There's a documentary that I think is online now too on YouTube. It's called A Brilliant Genocide. And I recommend people look that because it gives all the history and the context, how this fighting happened. Not only was the US training Museveni's army, the US was equipping the army with weapons. The US has trained Museveni's son his name is General Muhozi Kainerugaba, trained at the military academy at, at Fort Leavenworth. And he's now commander of a separate parallel army called the Special Forces Command, which is better equipped, better paid, and better trained than the National Army because it protects Museveni himself and his interest. And, 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 and he's the commander of the army, and Museveni hopes that he would succeed him should anything happen to him, Museveni himself. But, and all, all this is courtesy of U.S. taxpayers, taxpayer dollars. Mm, wow. Uh, well, and, uh, Milton, and let me tell you the other part. Mm -hmm. Let me just, I'll wrap up now very quickly. Sure. A Brilliant Genocide is a good documentary because it has interviews with 
former generals in Museveni's own army who say the Lord's Resistance Army and Joseph Cohn and Dominic Nguyen, they could have all been defeated within six months if Museveni wanted that. But he did not want that. In fact, the reports that he was providing the weapons to the LRA as well, because had he eliminated them too quickly, he would no longer be able to get money and weapons from the US, you see? <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a, a Machiavellian <laughs> dictator. Yeah. yeah. Well, but and, um, so Milton, um, I, I wanted to, to to go back to the part about um, the the arms because I remember during that time where there was um, uh, some news <laughs> report. I can't remember. Um, it was some some uh, news report that I remember <laughs> seeing where they spoke about Uganda during that time. Um, being the most heavily armed nation, yeah. Um, uh, uh, and, and I know we already talked about the United States being one of the chief arms exporters. Were right. there anyone, any other countries that were involved um, with the arming of, of these groups? The United Kingdom supplies mm. arms, and in recent years, France as well. But <laughs> the substantial, the bulk, has been coming from the United States. Yeah. Wow. That I mean, that that's that's just. <laughs> The, the the influence of the United States in in the international court, which is supposed to be an international court of justice, is so obscene. Especially, right. you know, Milton, since they're bringing up this, you know, the issue of of, of uh, Konye again, and uh, they're making an issue of the fact that he hasn't been captured, and they're making him out to be, mm -hmm. you know, the the chiefest of all of the culprits in the region. While, as you say, the the actual uh, uh, kingpin of all of the, the terrorists and cul culprits is Yureri Museveni, who, Absolutely. you know, I, I'm wondering, because Museveni uh, did just barely win, mm. win with quotes, <laughs> he, didn't win. <laughs> he did win, that's why we've got uh, the election in Uganda, there right. is a continued uh, movement uh, of people uh, opposition mm -hmm. um, in the streets against him, and we've talked about this before. And we, you yeah. know, we have we have uh, questions and maybe some concerns about Bobby Wine, but that's a different topic. Right. Um, and I hope we covered that well enough for folks last month. And if they're they still have issues, go back and watch that episode. I think it was right. a very good um, uh, examination of it. But, you know, there are continued uh, uprisings against the Museveni regime in Uganda and in the United States that is also not being covered. So right. what is going on on that front, on the people's front, uh, rising up against uh, Museveni and trying to get rid of it? Well, it's only a matter of time because the country is a very young country. They rejected him overwhelmingly. What Bobby Wine the leading candidate was able to do was to recruit, not only first recruit, but to inspire these young people. This is a young man who grew up in the so-called ghettos and uh, he worked his way through a university in Uganda. Then he used his musical and filmmaking talent to create mm -hmm. a whole industry and started promoting other young uh, Ugandans and realized that they could actually generate their own independent income so that they wouldn't have to uh, take bribes from the regime or be bought out. They could actually be an authentic opposition to the regime. And he recruited, he brought more than a million, maybe 1.5 to 2 million new voters in the last election. And that's essentially how he won. And Museveni is just declared the winner by yeah. the so-called election commission. Every member of that commission is appointed <laughs> by General Museveni himself. Hmm. So it, it, it's just crazy. And first of all, at the time his so-called victory was announced, mm -hmm. he had cut off the internet completely, meaning no data could come, could come in from the almost 35,000 polling stations. So no numbers could come in. So that's right. why the commission claimed he had won by almost 60% and gave Bobby Wine 35%. And then you're supposed to post the actual figures of the votes on, on the website within 48 hours, as required by the Constitution. Weeks, weeks later, those numbers had not yet been posted because they could manufacture a percentage 
but they were not comfortable with manufacturing the raw numbers when you are talking about millions of votes, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's where things stand. Mm -hmm. um, I think sooner or later, there's going to be a spark and the young people are going to come out and a situation comparable to what happened in the Sudan might happen where the youth in the Sudan said enough is enough and they drove out, they drove out uh, Omar Bashir, yeah. who had been there for 30 years, mm -hmm. a, a, a general, a dictator, but even his colleagues in the military said, at some point we have to side with the people and that's what we did. I, would be not, I won't be surprised if the same thing happens in Uganda. You cannot have a situation where 80% of the population is under the age of 35, and unemployment is at 80% at the same time. Oh, wow. How is that possible? You know? Mm -hmm. So the youth essentially have nothing to lose but to try to change their situation. And they try to do it the peaceful way by coming to vote. People who are not following the Ugandan election. I strongly advise you to go online, even if you have some concerns with Bobby Wine's politics, particularly after the endorsement of Guaido. You should look at what actually happened in terms of the youth of Uganda seeing him as a symbol of the change that is needed. So go mm -hmm. online, go on YouTube and, and watch Bobby Wine campaign, uh, Bobby Wine election campaign. Just put those search words and look at the raw numbers of people turning up. Young people, elderly people. And Museveni knows that he did not win this election. And mm -hmm. that is why even up today as we speak, the army is still deployed in all the major cities in Uganda because he knows it's a question of time. Something is going to happen on the streets. If they can't get it through the ballot box and no option is left, then he knows it's going to have to happen on the streets. Well, apparently, well, apparently it seems that Museveni is not only relying on the army, but he's also relying on... Uh, on the uh, lobbying firm. <laughs> yeah, yes. he is uh, relying on Washington lobbyists. Um, Absolutely. So what what is going on with uh, the Museveni regime? And, and I think it's very fitting that they, uh, there was a picture there of uh, Museveni with, yes. guess who, Barack yes. Obama yes. and yes. Michelle yes. Obama. That is so, yes. so yes. telling. Yeah. What is going on with Museveni hiring a, a Washington lobbying firm, particularly right. now? And please give us some context for this Absolutely. Picture, which I think is a great indictment. And what does this okay. have to do with the Obamas? Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Actually, um, this, this article that was focused on, 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 on the hiring of Mercury LLC, this uh, high-powered lobbying firm, I, I, maybe this was the only picture that they could find, <laughs> but, but, but I still want to make a comment on that. Mm -hmm. yes. That photo, I believe, was from 2012 when the U.S. had the U.S.-Africa Summit, U.S.-Africa Summit, and uh, President Obama had invited African leaders to come to Washington to meet with uh, US, the US business community, uh, basically so US corporations could uh, sign up deals uh, with uh, these African countries. So even though uh, Museveni is essentially an unindicted uh, war criminal, uh, since he's in charge of the resources of Uganda, that is the reason why he was also invited. I recall at that time, a number of us activists in the Uganda activist community, we had protests, we had petition campaigns uh, to try to get the administration not to invite Museveni because it would be an endorsement of somebody whom we said uh, is a criminal. And that's why I wanted to comment on that picture as well. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the current hiring, there's a lot of pressure now uh, because one of the other things that he's been doing, and this is something that we've been on top of, He's been kidnapping, torturing, and killing young Ugandans. Mm. To this, to, to, he's, he's, it's like a preemptive strike because you know sooner or later, these are the youth that are going to end up on the streets. So people have been abducted in broad daylight sometimes. Just 
you know, snatched off the streets and bundled into uh, uh, vehicles with no registration. <laughs> uh, now, 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 Milton, are these people that's part of any kind of resistance or activism or is just random people? Random people, so long as you identified as having supported uh, Bobby Wine or mm. the, his party's call, uh, the National Unity Platform. If mm. you're suspect of having supported them, <clears throat> or you are seen wearing the red T-shirt and barrette that was identified with that party, wow. uh, you can be a subject of kidnap, torture, and killing. So we have been pushing this uh, story, and uh, recently the so-called mainstream media started focusing on this story. The BBC did something. Al Jazeera actually was the first. I give them credit. They've been pretty consistent. They've been pretty good. Al Jazeera, the Washington Post, and then finally, the New York Times also did stories. Now, in conjunction with this, we've been also holding protests and demanding that, number one, stop selling weapons to Museveni. Yes. That's the demand we make on the US. Stop providing him with financial resources. If you're going to send any ass assistance, Send it directly to the beneficiaries, women's organizations, schools. You don't have to go through the regime since he diverts a good amount of that money anyway. The U.S. sends about a billion dollars in taxpayer, U.S. taxpayer money every year to this regime in Uganda. So we don't want blanket sanctions that, that harm Ugandans. That's right. I've never been a supporter of sanctions to harm any African people. But we want targeted sanctions that go after the regime. If mm -hmm. we know where the bank account is held, seize that bank account. So those are the type of actions we've been calling for. So finally, uh, recently, the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, announced a series of targeted sanctions against the Ugandan military and political leadership. The names have not been disclosed. Uh, obviously, we would hope that at Museveni would be one of those on that list. We would definitely hope that his son, uh, General Muhozi Kainarugaba, who is commanding the Special Forces Command, which is the, uh, the one that are carrying out these abductions and the torture and killing. Imagine sometimes a mother not knowing where their son is and then being told that your son's body has been, has been found on some, um, some forest somewhere. So this is exactly when, when Idi Amin's regime was collapsing in Uganda. Mm -hmm. This is how he started conducting himself. And this is exactly what Museveni is now repeating in Uganda. And that is why he needs firms like Mercury LLC mm -hmm. to whitewash his crimes. Because mm -hmm. normally these big firms have good connections with corporate media. Right. So they can spin this story around. But it's going to be difficult. Now that we forced uh, mainstream, so-called mainstream media, such as The Times, such as uh, BBC, uh, 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 not, no longer to pretend that the kidnappings is, is going, are going on in Uganda. So Mercury mm -hmm. LLC, Mercury would have to tell the world that the New York Times is lying, the Washington Post is lying, <laughs> you know, the, the, you know, the BBC is lying. Mm -hmm. So they have, they have a high burden to climb. And that, that is a point. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting confused by the delay. <laughs> um, so, so moving on from Uganda, um, yes. Milton, um, there appears to be some type of um, reconciliation between Somalia and Kenya. Somalia being a mess right now, um, there was some problems um, with the uh, president in Somalia right. um, uh, seeking another term. Um, how is that? How is that playing out? Um, we know that Somalia has a uh, has a lot of um, there's a lot of fighting going on there. So how is that playing out politically um, between the two? And how influential is Kenya um, uh, in the the politics or playing in the politics of Somalia? Kenya is influential because Kenya, as you know, borders with Somalia. Uh, so uh, Kenya is Somalia's uh, southern neighbor, and Somalia is Kenya's northern neighbor. Uh, there's a huge uh, population of Kenyan Somalians, you know, 
in that part of Kenya, in the in the northern part of Kenya. So they've had this uh, interrelationship for a long time, uh, which is not surprising. The whole continent had open relationship because these borders were drawn by Europeans right. at the Berlin Conference in 1884. So, but that's a whole issue that is, uh, uh, we would need another show to discuss this, that whole issue. <laughs> so, Somalia has been pretty unstable for about 30 years or so now, mm -hmm. since the collapse of General Mohamed Siad, Siad Barre. And at one time, Somalia was supported by the Soviet Union and then abandoned by the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union decided to support Ethiopia. And the US uh, came into that vacuum and started uh, uh, supporting Somalia. So in more recent years, the US claims that it is afraid that without an intervention force in Somalia, uh, the Al-Shabaab militants would seize power. And the US claims that Al-Shabaab is uh, interconnected with Al-Qaeda. So then they would have an entire country to plan uh, military action, sabotage, uh, acts of terrorism against the United States. So for that reason, the US has supported an intervention force in Somalia. Now, I agree that the Som Som Somalia needs an intervention force, but it has to be an authentic intervention force, uh, fellow Africans that want to help the people of Somali. Right. If they don't have the resources, the military equipment, if the US provides it and the logistic support to the African forces, that's fine, but it should be controlled by Africans. But that has not been the case. So what we've had in Somalia is essentially an occupying army. Mm. We've had as many as ranging at one right, right now, I think about 6,000, 6, at some point 10,000 Ugandan soldiers in Somalia, supposedly to keep the peace. Now, how is a dictator who has created <laughs> you know, havoc in Uganda, created massacres in Rwanda and the Congo, going to create peace in Somalia? Let's think about that. Wow. And, and, and who pays for this operation? The United States of America. So sometimes mm -hmm. when, you, when you think carefully, and this is something that I've had many conversations with my younger brother, and he said this to me a few years ago. And at that time, I did not find it something that I could easily accept as true. He said, you know what? The United States would pay billions of dollars to invest in chaos in an African country or mm -hmm. other parts of the world. And when you think about it, you know, your instinctive reaction is to say, no, that cannot be true. But if you look carefully, then the evidence bears it out. Right. You see? Yes, it does. You know, you so and 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 why would the US have the incentive to do that? And now I understand. And it's obvious you do not want a peaceful Africa where Africans actually can focus on developing and using the resources of Africa to build up Africa. And if you look at China before the Chinese Revolution. What was China like? China was the way Africa is today, mm -hmm. where Western forces could come and occupy parts of China, support one uh, warlord against the other, balkanize China. Mm -hmm. That was how China was. And that is why about 60 years ago, the per capita income of China was less than $100. It was about $98. And the per capita income of Ghana was over $200, you see? Wow. But China wow. has changed that within the last 60 years by kicking out all the banditry coming from outside China and the West and taking control of their politics and their resources. Whether you like their politics or not, nobody can deny that they are the masters of their destiny. They determine how to use their resources. We don't have that in Africa, you know? And it's very unfortunate. And that's why, you would rather have 
an occupying army like Uganda's, and people can also do this research, Uganda army selling weapons to Al-Shabaab <laughs> in really? Somalia. And, wow. you know, because sometimes <clears throat> if I just speak it, people would not have read it anywhere. So they would say, like, is what he's saying credible? Right, that's, why right. I, that's why I always uh, provide the information so people can go and look it up for themselves. So if you do that Google search, you'll find out that the Ugandan army, which is based on Somalia and financed mm -hmm. by the U.S., supposedly to keep the peace, has been selling some of the weapons to Al-Shabaab the same so-called terrorists that they're supposed to be fighting against. Now, somebody would ask, why would Uganda do that? Goes back to the same analogy I gave you earlier. Why would Uganda finance the LRA and keep it alive? Because if there's peace in Somalia, there would be no need to have 8,000 to 10,000 Ugandan soldiers in Somalia. You'd have to bring them home and you would lose that income that is coming from the United States for that deployment. Now yeah. you're getting to understand how Machiavellian <laughs> yeah. and this, when, you this know, Uganda ruler is, right? right? Yeah, and when you bring up the, the point of income and profit, let, let's be clear. American defense contractors of course, off of all of this along with the Absolutely. resource companies, the fossil fuel companies, the 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 diamond merchants, merchants, all of these, you know, the 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 raw material and mineral uh, mining operations, they Absolutely. all profit off of the chaos that is sown right. everywhere on the continent. Absolutely, deliberate chaos right. in order to to make resource extraction easier and cheap, mm. right? So you know, mm. Uganda has invaded. Congo, for example, occupied mm -hmm. Congo, causing all these massacres. You know, people should look it up. That is the uh, most neglected genocide anywhere. An estimated 6 million Congolese have died in that war, financed through the invasion of Congo from Uganda and Rwanda. At the same time that this genocidal war is going on, Western companies are extracting resources from mm -hmm. Eastern. Think about that. And you wouldn't be able to do it if there's peace, if there's peace, the central government in Kinshasa would demand that if you want to do business here, here's the license, here's mm -hmm. how much you're going to be paying, here's the the the, uh, the the percentage that is going to be coming to the Congolese people. Right, right. But rather than do it the proper way, they just want to plunder. So they go through Uganda and they go through Rwanda and they have the armies of those countries uh, and, and some of the crimes that have been committed is just amazing. It's, mm -hmm. you know, so horrific. You know, the mass rapes of women, rapes of men, just because of they want the resources. And the major media know about all this as well. You know, they all know. And yet they, they choose to, to, to suppress uh, these stories. Because if they wanted to expose it with the outreach that they have, all they would need to do is do a few editorials to expose this criminal enterprise between General Museveni and the United States establishment. For 35 years now, they've maintained them. But I think the young people in Uganda are not going to allow that anymore. Well, wow. before we move on, uh, Milton, I just want to um, just let everybody know that um, our guest, our, our, our special guest, um, Milton Alamadi, who we uh, have here on Black Power Media once a month to discuss mm -hmm. the affairs of what's happening on in the Africa continent and um, in the rest of the diaspora, because mm -hmm. we're going to cover um, something else in the diaspora that's outside the African continent, um, Milton, if you don't mind. Um, but um, in the, in the, uh, before we go back to uh, our subject, Jackie, mm -hmm. uh, let's holler at some of the folks that's in the chat. Yeah, because I think some folks were a little thrown off because we started a little early today. We did. We apologize, but we got... Today was incredibly busy for us. We did try to get to uh, the protest at the uh, Mercury uh, uh, lobbying firm, uh, right. but I think they had moved on by the time we got there. Okay. Uh, but but you know, just we we will definitely because we had hoped that we would have some uh, footage to share with folks at the beginning of the hour. But you know, just keep us posted on on those kinds of actions, and and we will catch up with folks at some point, but we are really grateful that our friends, uh, Boscor777, Lisa Catlett, uh, uh, Obiama Oyohia, uh, Manon Patterson, Zarek Tuvok, 
uh, Jabarion M., uh, Ricky Ryan, Leah Boggs, James Thompson, David Silberg, Big Teal, uh, Phil Winter, Robert Kevin Appler. Uh, let's see, who did I leave out? Deborah Rodriguez. Yeah. Uh, all of you all James have Thompson, joined yeah. us. Yep, James Ricky Thompson, Ryan. we got you. And Veronica Ancrum and, yeah. Shirley. and Shirley. Thank you all very much for joining us and uh, joining us and Milton Alamadi. Right. Don't forget those likes. Like, yes. Yeah, with them likes Hit up, the like join, button, subscribe, share, yeah. subscribe, join Black Power Media, invite your friends, all that kind of good stuff. We see you, Kim. What's going on? Hello, everyone. So, what what else? What else did we want? All right. Well, we, we well we talked about and Milton. Um, you brought up the fact about um uh, that that you agree that there should be some kind of intervention force in Somalia. Um, it reminds right. me of controlled by Africans. Right. Yeah, right. Right. Africans Africa. that are not puppets, uh, like uh, uh, like Museveni, puppet. Right. Right. So, so that eliminates the United Nations, right? Right. Right. So, 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 so thanks for that clarification. Um. But but I was I was reminded of the African Union, and so we're going to segue into this. Where the African Union actually told the Chadian government that they're basically on their own. What is that all about? Well, the African Union, unfortunately, is uh, is not the African Union that uh, Kwame Nkrumah envisioned. You know, mm. he envisioned an African Union that would be able to. Uh, steer Africa toward a United States of Africa. Because as he argued in neo-colonialism, the last stage of imperialism, that is the only way we'll be able to protect our resources. And people that don't have the time, just read the introduction alone. It's about 12 pages, essentially summarizes uh, his philosophy. He said they wanted our resources before independence, they will continue to want it after independence. And how will they do it? With military intervention or by promoting uh, he called them limited wars, small-scale wars in African countries. And that's what is going on. Or financing a neo-colonial president in Africa who would undermine other African presidents. And we've seen that. Mobutu, one example. And now, in the 21st century, we have uh, Yoweri Museveni. That is the African Union that uh, Nkuma envisioned. The African Union we have today is substantially financed by the West. Mm. So if somebody else cuts your check, you know, that, it, that comes with conditions. Right. So the African Union, number one, has a, a, a law, and France, by the way, is almost single-handedly destroying the African Union. So the mm. African Union <clears throat> has a, a rule. If the military seizes power, because unfortunately, the military has rarely been progressive in Africa. It was progressive in Burkina Faso under Thomas Sankara. Mm -hmm. But elsewhere, the military has been very reactionary. As Thomas Sankara said, if you do not provide them with the philosophical, intellectual, uh, ideological training, then a soldier with a weapon is basically a bandit, an armed bandit. That's what Sankara mm -hmm. said. And sadly, in African countries, that's turned out to be uh, the case. So the African Union at some point came up with this new uh, law. If the army takes over in an African country, then that country automatically, its membership is suspended from the African Union. And mm -hmm. that law was made in order to, uh, uh, to create a penalty so that the military will think twice before they take over power. Because once you're suspended, it involves a trade sanctions. So th th there's a really a economic price and a political price that you pay. So that uh, was actually becoming something workable. You know, the military would think twice before just intervening. But now we saw what happened in, in Mali. Mm -hmm. In Mali last year when the military took over, uh, the African Union, instead of making the demands that the military should go back in barracks, if there are any issues, let the politicians, you know, work it out. No, they came up with this sort of uh, arrangement where the military would have the substantial power with a smattering of some civilians involved. And that was basically a French creation. And wow. I, think, mm. I think the coup itself was a French coup d'etat. <laughs> because before the coup, the civil society uh, had been protesting for months and months and months. 
and they were determined to push out a government that they said was inept and was corrupt. And it was a, it, it, and a lot of young people and students were involved in the protests, you know? So I think France saw that as something a bit too radical, mm -hmm. you know, that these guys might actually end up having an authentically independent government. <laughs> so I think France was scared of that. And France, because no coup d'etat in a former French colony in Africa can occur successfully without the support of France. So that was a French coup, that's how I call it. So they preempted the authentic progressive uprising that was ongoing in France. And now the African Union just stood aside and basically did nothing. And now you have the same situation in Chad, right? Where the dictator Idris Deby was killed in a power struggle. So they made up this, you know, fancy story about him dying on the battlefront, the you front know, line, yes. all, 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 all nonsense, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so his son now steps in when they have a constitution that says, if the president dies, the speaker of the national assembly, which is like their parliament, mm -hmm. become, becomes the president. So the army steps in there. And how do you know this is with French approval? Because who shows up at the funeral of Idris Deby? President Macron. Hmm. Of, of France. He's yeah. sitting right there. He's sitting right there in front with the son of Idris Deby, Mohamed Deby, who now is leading a military regime in Chad. But I'm so very like happy. endorsement. Absolutely. Like, oh, right, that's right, a, right. a stamp of approval. Wow. So, but I'm happy to see that Chadians are not having it. They're coming out on the streets in Chad. They're coming out on the streets here in DC. Mm -hmm. They're coming out in the streets here in New York in front of the United Nations. And in Paris, where they have a huge uh, diaspora uh, population, they're coming out in the streets as well. And this is increasingly what young Africans need to do in every African country. I call it the fight for Africa's independence. That's what it is. The independence of the 1960s was independence on paper. Yes, it was useful in the sense that it gave us a wider platform from which to continue the struggle, mm -hmm. but the struggle ultimately has to re end in, the, in Africans controlling Africa's resources. Only then can it translate into true independence. Just like I give the analogy of apartheid. I think I disagree with people that undermine Nelson Mandela. Mandela proved himself on several categories. People, not, some people are not even aware that Mandela was trained in guerrilla warfare so it meant at some point he realized that the peaceful approach was not going to work in South Africa. Right. He went to Algeria. He went to Ethiopia. He learned sabotage. He learned military tactics. He read all the, he read Mao Zedong. And he came back to South Africa and started laying bombs in government institutions. In his philosophy, he said, I didn't believe in going after civilians. I wanted to go after state institutions. Mm -hmm. So they started hitting the target. And then he was arrested. How was he arrested? The CIA provided a tip to South African intelligence that, you know, you see that guy, that man in that disguise, look a bit more carefully. <laughs> and that's how Mandela was arrested. Yeah. And not a lot of people know this, but you can Google it. The Guardian did a very good story on it. The mm -hmm. BBC actually did a story on it too. He was arrested, he was tried, and that's how he ended up being convicted and sentenced for life, <laughs> a, a blessing. And released <laughs> at, at 27 years. Now, was there an agenda in terms of releasing Mandela? Yes, of course, there was an agenda. Number one, if he had died incarcerated, then you know the reaction mm -hmm. would have been much more radical. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah. the European uh, establishment in South Africa did not want that. The West did not want that, right? That would disrupt uh, commerce and profit. Right. That, that's, that, that's, that's number one. Number two, why not release somebody who is still very influential and commands all this influence in South Africa, in Africa, and globally, and work out conditions that would still favor you, the establishment? Mm -hmm. Now, was Mandela wrong for doing that? I say no. He had lived out his life. Let him come out and not die behind bars. Let formal apartheid end, 
And now you have a wider platform mm -hmm. for young Africans to engage in the next phase of the struggle, mm -hmm. which is to recover the land. And that's why now you have people like Julius Malema yes. leading yeah. the struggle. So the end of apartheid was very revolutionary. Mm. Let the struggle continue. And I say that the end of colonial rule in Africa was also revolutionary. It gave us a wider platform, but we haven't really uh, secured the ultimate victory, which is economic control. But right. people like Sankara would not have emerged to continue the fight had mm -hmm. it not been for the end of formal colonial rule. Now, the our biggest enemy, unfortunately, are our fellow brothers in mm. many of these African countries who are imposed like the gatekeepers mm -hmm. for Western establishment and West, Western profits. So mm -hmm. if we get rid, rid of all those and re, we revisit the vision of Kwame Nkrumah and eventually have a United States of Africa, only then can we win uh, true independence. China did it, and I think Africa can do it as well. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would love to do a show. I think just in the first like hour that we've been talking, we talked about three of the, you know, the, the next three show topics that we're going to have, because I absolutely oh. <laughs> want to focus on uh, uh, Joseph Malema, Winnie Mandela, the legacy of, of uh, Nelson Mandela, yeah. and what's how it's all connected to the struggle in South Africa mm, right, right now, which is, it, it is it is as large and intense, and I think as influential as what is going on in Uganda and what is, right. is, is sh uh, shaping up in yeah. Chad, but right. again, Western media is ignoring it. So right. I think maybe that might be the next place we go uh, right. next month, because uh, I, right. I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. But I want All right. to... And, and, and the good thing is by next month, I think my book would be out by then. So oh, I, wonderful. Yeah, the final draft has gone to the uh, the publishers. I think once I think they may have a print date already by the end of mm -hmm. the month. And the title of the book explains it all. Mm. It, is, it is called Manufacturing Hate, How Western Media Demonized Africa. Hmm. Yeah. Well, we can't wait. Yeah, that that's that's going to be great. We cannot wait for that. But yeah. I, I want to go back to a question in the comments here, and this yes. is about uh, France and China. This anti-China discourse. Big Teal said, "I think this whole anti-China discourse that's taken storm is a cover-up for long-standing French col French colonization because a lot of mainstream media is silent on France." Yes. And, and I, I pointed that question out because I was going to ask you, Milton, hmm. why do you think people in the United States in particular think that France is like this beacon of democracy as and it's liberty, supposed yeah. to exist? Is it because we know so little about French involvement Absolutely. Uh, in, in colonization, in the colonization project of Africa? Right. Um, and also, I think this is a good connection to uh, the the conversation we're having about China's uh, uh, involvement on the continent isn't on the same. And we've had this conversation. Right. It, China's not imperial. They're, they're not colonizing Africa. But some of their involvement in some right. of the places and in some of their... Uh, um, um, uh, I, I guess uh, uh, negotiations or deals with some uh, uh, localities or governments right. are not exactly equal. You're so, not yeah, can, I mean, can, so can you tackle that for us and uh, <clears throat> untangle? You know, is is this anti-China rhetoric like a cover for what for France still having a strong neo-colonial imprint uh, right. on the continent because it's just easy to demonize China right now? Of course, it's not only uh, France though; it's the U.S. as well, and mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, and it's racist as well. It's, mm. it's clear, clearly very racist. I mean, uh, and, and not that there are not issues with China as well, and I'll get into that in a second. But to answer the first part of your question, yes, it is because the symbolism of France, the Eiffel uh, Tower, mm -hmm. the LSA Palace, mm -hmm. and uh, being a, a part of NATO being a part of the, uh, uh, the, the Western leaders that uh, uh, periodically meet together 
to discuss right. uh, global economies. So France is a part of that uh, that team, part of that uh, uh, that uh, uh, colonial and neo-colonial heritage. So they're, they're 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 team players. They're on the same team, mm -hmm. and and China, China was not even a part of the equation until recently. Uh, China did not matter when China was still uh, politically and economically in a similar position as Africa, most of Africa is today. So China was not a threat then. But now today, China has become a global power, economically, politically, and militarily. Mm -hmm. And the West happened to be the only players in Africa at one point. So Africa had no bargaining margin. You have to deal with the West. You want finance? Yes, you'll get capital from the World Bank or the IMF, but this is what we want you to do in return for the capital. Mm -hmm. And that's how it was from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. It's only in recent years that China has emerged as a major economic power with capital that is able to now invest in other parts of the world, including, by the way, in the United States. <laughs> yeah, yeah. China is the biggest uh, global purchaser of, uh, of US uh, uh, treasuries, right? Uh, right? The US right now, the economy is essentially very dependent on China as well. And yet the US uh, does not want China to operate in Africa because it presents a genuine threat Mm -hmm. And the U.S. would not mind competing with France in Africa, with Britain in Africa, but it minds competing with China in Africa because China comes from a different ideological background and history. And then, you know, China, they're Chinese. So that's when the racist right. part of it, you know, also uh, comes into play. But now I have to go back to my original premise that if you do not control your resources, it doesn't really matter. You are going to be exploited. So I don't think it's a, a good thing to say that China is less exploitative than the West. No, I can't see that as a bonus. I don't want anybody exploiting Africa. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right? But is China better in terms of its engagement with Africa than the West, historically? The answer is, of course, yes. China has not invaded and occupied any African country. China has not committed massacres in any African country. And in fact, China, and which is unique because the China of the 20th century is not the same as the China of the 21st century. Mm. For example, in the 1960s, uh, when most African countries were still fighting for their independence. You know, in some countries, they had to take up arms, right? right. Sure. Mm -hmm. Kenya, Mozambique, Angola, mm -hmm. Guinea-Bissau, the weapons were coming either from the Soviet Union or from China. Yeah. So mm -hmm. China and the Soviet Union had a special relationship with African countries. Then later, off, later on, of course, Cuba came on the scene in the 1970s, and Cuba then developed that also special relationship with uh, African countries. In fact, uh, as Cuba went much farther, Cuba deployed Cuban sons and daughters to yes. fight alongside uh, Africans. So That's beyond right. just supplying weapons mm -hmm. and training, they came and shed Cuban blood. Mm. One estimate I saw of 10,000 Cuban soldiers dying in Angola. And of course, mm. by kicking out South Africa in, in Angola, that led to the independence of, of South Africa. But going back to China. So China was not yet an economic power in the 60s, mm -hmm. right? So any economic assistance China gave came at a tremendous sacrifice uh, to, the, to, to China itself and the people of China. Yet China wanted to have true friends in Africa, ideological friends as well. So China built what's called the Tanzania-Zambia Railroad from the late 60s to the early 70s which is over 1,300 miles long. And that was done at a concessionary rate 
So they didn't give Tanzania like this high interest rate that they couldn't pay over here. In fact, a lot of a lot of the uh, uh, the money was forgiven and turned into grants. You see, so that was a very special relationship at that time. That's before China became an industrial power. Now China is an industrial power, just like the West. And industrial powers, their number one demand is always raw material. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Africa has all the raw material in the world. So now China's number one relationship is based on what access can they have to raw materials. Unlike in the 1960s, when China, under Chairman Mao, uh, under uh, Shou Enlai, who was the prime minister, they supported a person like Julius Nyerere in Tanzania, mm -hmm. substantially for ideological purposes, you see? So there was not so much an economic agenda to benefit from the resources. But now, in the 21st century, China needs the resources. So a lot of it is going to end up being the kind of situation you describe where, you know, you sign these deals that are for like, uh, you know, decades, decades long at uh, rates that are very favorable to China. And as an African country, you know, you need the money, so you take it. But at the end of the day, you end up losing because you remain um, not industrialized. You're still dependent on sending your, selling your raw materials either to China or the West. One of my favorite economists, the late uh, Samira Amin, said the onus is really on African leaders. And I agree with him because he said China needs the resources. China will pay you whatever, you know, you can mm -hmm. negotiate hundreds of millions of dollars for the resources. But if you're a smart African leader, you don't want that. If you have negotiated a deal, let's just pick a number. Let's say for 500 million. You say, I would rather take. 300 million and 200 million of that let it be in transfer of technology teach me the skill right, right, so right now i know how to build the railway myself now i know how to build that factory myself you see so i'm not dependent on anybody on china or the west right so now i build those factories it means now some of that raw material i'm selling to you i can use it in my own factories and manufacture things that i can sell at a much higher price, you know? I can create, I can manufacture computers. I can you manufacture these uh, mobile phones. I can manufacture automobiles. I can manufacture all these things that African countries still import, either from the West or from China. So the onus is on, so, so we talk about Africa being exploited, yes. But I want to drive the onus back to bad African leadership, you know, I want, Africa to have more leaders like Thomas Sankara. <laughs> yes. And Burkina Faso barely had any resources, but look what he was able to accomplish in three years. Yeah, right, in a short mad period mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. Right, because what he did was he freed the mind of the people of Burkina Faso. He said, you can do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Why do you have to import clothes from Europe when we make the beautiful, the most beautiful clothes here in mm -hmm. Burkina Faso? Mm -hmm. And they realized it was right. And he built that sense of pride again. They built their own railroad in Burkina Faso without going out to the World Bank or IMF. So if you had, and obviously that was danger, right? Mm -hmm. So why do, why, why do they not eliminate a person like uh, General Museveni? They right. want to that's the puppet. Why, right. do they, why, do they, why do they eliminate a person like Sankara? Right. right. So, Who's so in touch with the masses, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Milton, I, I want to get into something that you pointed out, and and something that someone is asking about in the chat, because I think we need to make this clear. Um, Shirley says, "You mean to tell me that Africans don't know how to build fac factories and mass transit?" When you talk about the problem is bad African leadership and Africans not controlling. Uh, their own manufacturing and that don't have control of their resources. You're not saying that Africans don't know how to do these things. No, they know how to do it. But it's more than knowing how to do it. Right. right. When, you, when you build a factory, you build it because you have a market for the products. You see? Mm -hmm. But essentially, you're not even allowed to build a factory. 
Let's say you want to build a factory to produce computers, for example. When you start producing computers, the cost is going to be very high initially, mm -hmm. meaning the price is also going to be very high initially till you fine tune the production process, right? If you're going to build it by learning yourself. Right. Because you're not going to get somebody to give you the skills, you know? Nobody's going to share the skills with you and make you a competitor, right? right. So every country that has industrialized did it in a number of ways. In the case of Britain, by plundering from around the world, right? Stealing the resources of other people, whether in Africa, whether in Asia, whether it's in uh, Latin America or the Caribbean, enslaving uh, Africans uh, to work mm -hmm. for British profit in the Caribbean, and then siphoning the profit back to Britain, and from colonialism, where you had at your disposal all the resources of Africa and all the labor of Africa. And that's how you build that initial capital, you know, and in its simplest form, no matter what brilliant business idea you have, without capital, without financing, without a loan, you wouldn't be able to do anything, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so let's agree on that. So now Africa is in a position where the capital is not there. The accumulated capital is not there. People basically work to feed themselves. Mm -hmm. So there's not like extra capital that can be diverted, you know, to building the factories. That's only one part of the hurdle, as I said. Once you build it, you need to have consumers for the products. And most countries did it by protecting their domestic market, right? So mm -hmm. Britain, for example, would not allow uh, products that Britain is trying to manufacture to be imported from France or right. Germany. Right. Unless until a time that the British have become efficient in producing it, then they can open up the markets because now they want to export theirs to France and Germany right. as well. Right. So now there's an interest in having the markets open. The US also had a, they call it a tariff regime, right, mm -hmm. protection, until this industry came up to par. South Korea, these countries that industrialized more recently, the same thing, you know, be before the products were, uh, were not competitive, they would not allow anybody to import it from other countries until they refine theirs after many years, and then they open up the markets because now, uh, as you know, South Korea is a, a major uh, manufacturer of global uh, equip electronic equipment now. Mm -hmm. Africans can do, the, can do the same thing, but they would need that period to develop those products. They would need to have tariff protections. They would need to go through a phase where uh, people would not be able to import those products until Africa's also fine tuned it and then opened the market for everybody else. So people might ask, so why is Africa not doing that? Right. The World Bank will not allow an African country to do that. Oh, wow. One of the conditions of getting the loan is this, that you keep your market open, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so called free market. So mm -hmm. if your market is open, it means you cannot protect any industry. Mm. You, can't say, you can't say, I want, my country to be able to produce cheap, cheap, cheap computers for all the schools in my country. Right. For the entire African continent. But I need 10 years, you know, to fine tune it. Right. So I'm not going to allow any computers to be imported for five years. In five years time, I'm going to be producing good computers. Now my computer can compete with Dell mm -hmm. or anybody else. So now I'm going to open the market. The World Bank won't allow that to happen. And that is why Africa remains, <laughs> bless you, a seller, mm -hmm. a seller of the raw uh, ingredients that go into all these products and not a producer. China is in a unique position if China really wanted to take Africa to the next level because China now has the technology. China mm -hmm. has the capital. And if China were to become very radical and say, you know what? I'm going to help a number of African countries become totally liberated. Right. 
I'm going to go there and show them and also provide the technical know-how and the, and the capital, you know, to produce certain range of products so that they don't have to import it from the West anymore. So if China could develop that special relationship with African countries and in return, African countries could say, if you help us do that, you will have exclusive access to our mineral resources. Wow. Mm. wow. We will deal with you first, and then maybe we'll talk with the West so that we can all rise together. China, you're already ahead, but if you help us do that, we'll also be at your level within a short time. And that, that is part of the conversation that is not happening mm -hmm. in, with, with, between China and Africa, because now you don't have the kind of leadership, people like, people like, like Sankara, people like Julius Nyerere, who could look beyond, you know, just making a $500 million from China right now and say, no, 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 no. The $500 million is good, but I'd rather get two, 300 million and build a longer term project so that my son or my grandson right. is going to be running a fully developed African country that is officially sending aid to the West. Right now, Africa is sending aid to the West um, unofficially, right? <laughs> unofficially, because they they buy the products for very cheap. That's a way of Africa sending aid to the West. <laughs> it's not seen as aid, right? But it is actually. Right. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. France would not be a major power without the resources from Africa. And that is why France is now the most outright militaristic imperial power in Africa, mm. determined not to lose that. France mm. is in the position that Portugal was in the 1970s, when all the European countries, uh, Britain, you know, France, were uh, allowing at least independence on paper to their former colonies. Mm -hmm. Portugal was not going to have it. Why? Because Portugal was one of the most impoverished European countries. And Portugal could not afford to let those colonies go. So they had to fight their way to independence. Now, today, in the 21st century, France, I think it's 75% of the energy in France is nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. All of the uranium comes from Africa. All of it. From, oh, Mali, of it. from Mali, from Chad, and Niger. Oh, my goodness. And if France was really paying for those resources, Chad, Mali, Niger would not be some of the most important impoverished countries mm. in Africa, let alone the world. Just think about that. Wow. So the people of Chad, the people of Mali, the people of Guinea are subsidizing the living standards in France. Think about that. And Milton, let me, uh, let me uh, play um, a little pan-African uh, uh, thing here, because one of the things that we try to highlight when we do uh, all talk together is um, the Pan-African aspect of these things here. Yes. So um, Akon said one time, the, the entertainer, and he said this a few years ago, right. but he was he was actually reaching out to the diaspora, and he said, you know, Africa is the only place where Africans in the diaspora can, can set up Fortune 500 companies. Um, the scenario that you just named about when you gave the example of the computer, right. could you um, give a scenario of how those of us in the diaspora can work with those on the continent to circumvent the uh, um, these restrictions that the IMF come to, where we both benefit and start to put together the framework of Pan-Africanism uh, cooperation. Oh, definitely, without a doubt. If there was a diaspora bank, for example, the spending power of African descendants in the United States is estimated at what, $1.5 trillion? Well, that, that's, that, that's, one of those, that's one of those things that's let's, another let's see, let's, invention. Let's even of, cut it in half. Let's even cut it in mm -hmm. half. It's still more than everybody else in the diaspora. Let's cut it in half. Let's go with even 750, uh, uh, 750. Right. Half of that. That is much more than the World Bank can ever provide to African countries. 
So if we had progressive leadership on both sides of the ocean and make a determination that we are going to start with a few African countries and just focus. Yes. Let's start with Ghana, uh, Nigeria, and uh, maybe Tanzania, maybe. Pick a few of these countries. Mm -hmm. And let's go and invest where the benefits are shared mutually between Africans and their sisters and cousins here, diaspora Africans, right. a, AKA African Americans, you see? Mm -hmm. They would not give those kind of conditions to African countries. They would not say, in return for our investment, we want you to stop spending on education. <laughs> right, right. We want you to cut subsidy on health care, right? They won't make those kind of ridiculous conditions. And that is what Africa truly needs. And go back to my one of my favorite economists again, Samir Amin. He had said African countries have to find a way to get financing to uh, exploit their raw materials. That is different from the World Bank and the IMF. And at one time he had said China is a potential source. Brazil is a potential source. Brazil was emerging at that time under Lula and had a progressive leadership now compared to the reactionary that you now have in Brazil. But he never suggested that diaspora Africans here in the United States could be that part of that source as well. And wow. I, I certainly see that as part of the source. You know, go there, invest in, in commercial, uh, sustainable commercial agriculture, for example. You know, Africa has 60% of the world's uh, uncultivated arable land. Mm. Right. So okay. now we have we have puppets like Museveni kicking Africans off the land, right? Mm -hmm. And inviting so-called investors from Europe and the Middle East, you know? Wow. Mm -hmm. Diaspora Africans from this country would not go there and kick Africans off the land. They would work together with that, see? So that mm -hmm. both are now benefiting. And now let's go to the factory. And I, I'm happy that somebody asked me that question about the factory. Sometimes you can even start small scale. Mm -hmm. And this is an idea that I'm myself personally keenly interested in mm -hmm. and want to be a part of. Chocolate. The last three or four years, I personally cut off sweets, right? But I know people like chocolate, so I'm willing to invest in chocolate. <laughs> Although me, myself, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to cut off 100% of sweets. So Ghana, right, and mm -hmm. Ivory Coast, between them, they produce like what, 80 or 90% right. of the world's uh, cocoa. Cocoa, yeah. Which is the ingredient for chocolate. But yet the other day, I was at... Uh, Whole Foods, and I looked at uh, the container, the package of the chocolate, right? You know, made in Belgium. Belgium does mm -hmm. not grow any chocolate, cocoa. Right, right. Yeah, that's right. right. So I would like to start with industries that are that you can start while we wait for this master plan. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 I would like to establish chocolate factories in Ghana. And I would like to partner with my sisters and brothers here, you know, diaspora mm -hmm. Africans, and market this chocolate to the community. Mm. And I would like to get, whether it's an, an, an NBA star or some other star in some other music maybe or entertainment, to be the face of that product. So it doesn't have to be, you know, Milton's chocolate. You pick it. If if you want it, if you want it to be LeBron's, that's fine. You know, <laughs> LeBron's chocolate, right? Right, mm -hmm. right. But now you have a factory that you invested in because you know you have a market for that product. Mm -hmm. If Le LeBron says, "Yes, this is good chocolate," that chocolate will sell. Mm -hmm. You see, that's just one example of that something that can be done, and you can duplicate that to other types of products. 
And you can right. duplicate that across a number of African countries. And, and you know, I'm sorry, hon, but I just got to say this real quick, and, and, and I'll definitely turn it uh -huh. No, No, thank you for that. And the reason why I'm glad that you that you elaborated on that, because a lot of times we get so deep into the problem and we don't talk about solutions. Oh, we and need solutions. What, right. And and what you just um, laid out there is and I, I'll, put, I'll tell you this. You um, uh, you got two people that's willing to go with you on that. Um, uh, uh, me, my, uh, the Luke Mines will definitely mm -hmm. go with you on it because right. This is something that that this was the dream of of Kwame Nkrumah. Absolutely, it was the dream of a lot of uh, Pan Africanists that this is that we should be benefiting mm -hmm. from exactly. the resources of the continent. And I'm right. so glad that you said it because the set up chocolate factories or, or or other small factories that we can do right away that's not nothing impossible to do. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And now you're 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 providing employment uh, for people in Ghana. They're not just growing the cocoa. And selling it for like for peanuts to mm -hmm. the outside world, right. and then the, you know the real money is made when it's packaged nicely as mm -hmm. chocolate. You know the Ghanaian does not get any cut of that. Right and now he's going to be getting a good cut of that. Now they're getting what's called skilled type work mm -hmm. because working factories you know right. become more skilled labor. Now they're getting training in managerial skills as well. You see, mm -hmm. and on the other hand here. Uh, we as investors, you know, we also being able to, you know, to pay the rent, you know. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so win, 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 win. Yeah. Right. So okay. So I think here's where we we have a we have a point of contention. I think if if we'll say, uh, because this is where I think uh, the capitalist machine is very good at confusing. Uh, Africans here on the continent and right. Africans on uh, uh, here in, in, in the United States right. and Africans on the continent about how things really are with us. Because there's this, right. you know, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the one point, however, eight trillion dollars of wealth buying power of black people. Right. That is something that was created by a marketing firm that actually right. doesn't even exist in any it, it it is just something that was written down on paper that said let's this is a good way to market products to black people mm -hmm. tell them they have a lot of spending power all this 1.8 trillion dollars in spending power and it does two things it it helps co companies uh have an inroad to market to black folks where otherwise they wouldn't figure out you know, how do we sell things to black people? We don't know how to talk to them. So, oh, okay, mm -hmm. we'll just tell them they have $1.8 trillion of spending power. And hey, look, you can come spend that money with us. Right. But then it also does this other thing where people use it as a political tool to shame black people who don't, quote unquote, spend their money wisely. And those right. are always poor and working class black people. Because the truth is, if there is this thing called, uh, you know, whatever spending power black people have in this country, it is largely go going toward paying our bills. It's going toward rent, right. food, clothes. Right. That we don't have 1.8 trillion extra dollars to spend on anything. Right, right. And so, right. so the idea right. of, you know, black buying power as an extra additional amount of money. Right. that black people have that we can invest in 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 anything is not true however however mm. here i think is where even with that misunderstanding like folks like akon because he's brought that up before you know mm -hmm. black folks right. just don't spend no. their money right because they got all this no, no. Money. akon is not a reference point at all in fact akon <laughs> is a, a reactionary and i'll get into that in a minute he recently was dining and whining with Museveni in Uganda. And he made the wow. most outrageous statement. He said, democracy is not good for every country in the world. Oh, you know, so God. we'll get into that in a minute, but continue. I want you to finish your line. Because yeah, the, oh wow, that, I didn't yeah. even see. This is no. why we have these conversations. Yeah, yeah, he's, we, a, you know, he's, he's a big we, reaction, reactionary, yeah, unbelievable. We've got to get yeah. our, if, we, yeah. if, if we're going to have relations yeah. with yeah. our relations yeah. throughout but, the but, but, here, but, but But here's the other point though. There is a substantial amount of underutilized black capital in the United States. There are wealthy uh, black folk in the United States. Sure. 
True. Who could better direct their resources and benefit more from the resources that they now control by engaging with Africa? That, they, that's would do, they would do so much better off and the people they deal with in Africa, it could actually provide that pathway to economic liberation. We need to break that monopoly of capital coming from the IMF and the World Bank and the conditions that they lay out. And yeah. I think one possible way of breaking it is by engaging with uh, diaspora Africa. And, 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 and also feel so that the, the numbers we, you know, we can quibble with. And mm -hmm. here's the other part also that I would like to be done differently. I would like those factories that we end up being a part of in the African countries for Africans to be co-owners of those yes. factories as well. So it'd be like a cooperative system yes, yes, that yes, they yes. have shares so that we don't become the new class of right. exploitators as well. Exactly. So that they can actually pass their shares to their children and their children's children and right. we create that level of empowerment, you know. Yes. Now, now I will say mm. that despite, you know, the 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 gross misinformation of all this extra black spending power and it is true that there are wealthy black people in this country, not a whole lot of wealthy Africans. We see them differently because yeah, there are Oprah's and LeBron's and, and, you know, all these wealthy people, but right. their class interest is to the capitalist. Right. Um, LeBron might be on some kind of path to wherever he's going, right. but we ain't gonna get no money from Oprah. Yeah, they, they, need, they, they need to be taught. They need to be taught. We should yeah, not. That, that, that we, is we, a political we, education issue, yeah. but here, here, here's the point mm -hmm. I want to make. Mm -hmm. I think the power that we have to achieve this is in the collectivism that we're always striving for among ourselves, among us who are in this movement of radicals who are already moving toward uh, uh, scientific socialism. We're already educating on that. So why mm -hmm. not expand that to include collective uh, actions economically, not just to support ourselves, but also to partner with our uh, relatives throughout the diaspora. So I think the initial steps, I think, is where we can begin this as we're kind of simultaneously continuing on this path of wider political education um, and, you know, reaching out to some folks with a little bit of extra coin and seeing where they are and if they can be educated uh, into joining this. Because, you know, like Kwame Torre said, our people are not, um, they're not apathetic. They're, 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 their energies are misdirected. And I think that's a bunch of rich folk too. So our job is to redirect their energy to the focus, to focus on who our collective enemies are. Um, and for people, those of us who are African in this country with a little bit more money, they think that their enemy is poor people, but it's our job to redirect their energy to realize that no, your enemy is the capitalist too. Absolutely, and but we need to get, we need to rescue our sisters and brothers on the continent. We need to provide them with a source of a living, because if you have an African puppet throwing people off the land, then what recourse do they have? if you don't even control the land for your sustenance anymore, you know, mm -hmm. what recourse do you have? You know, think about the, deci the, the, the decision for an African. And now you see a lot of women too, and it's not only young men, trying to cross the Mediterranean, knowing that probably five, five out of 10 times, you're gonna end up drowning, but still taking that risk anyway. So you must imagine how horrendous conditions must be for them. And when they go there and they make it to Europe, and whether they're working as enslaved laborers in those farms in Southern Italy, whether they're cleaning toilets or roads or working in kitchens, what do they do with the money, the little money that they make? They're sending it back home to support their parents, to support their relatives. We don't need for them to be in that condition when the resources exist, right but the resources are being diverted for the interest 
of the elite, uh, the as uh, Rodney called them, the comprador, mm -hmm. the petit bourgeoisie in Africa. We can't allow that to happen. So we have to circumvent them and introduce a new source of capital to allow them to remain on the land and allow them to be relevant as the global economy continues to become much more sophisticated. And now that they're in an economically empowered space, then they'll be able to make more decisions. They would say, this is the amount of engagement I want with the West. And this is the amount of engagement I don't want. This is the amount of engagement I want with China for that matter. Right. And, mm -hmm. and this is the amount that I want. China doesn't sit there in China and says, oh, how will our decisions impact Africa? No, it's how will our decisions impact China? And then Africa comes into the equation. I want African countries to be in that position where the new leadership can determine their decisions based on its impact on the people of Africa. And Africa needs partners with some amount of capital because without capital, you can talk all day, you can have all the greatest plans, as I said, you won't be able to execute any one of them. You see? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. look at how much education Sankara was able to do. Convert an entire country, yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. One individual, determined individual. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, 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 Kwame Ture. Look at the impact he had up to date mm -hmm. as an individual in changing the consciousness, you know? Look at the impact that Malcolm had in changing the consciousness. And I think we can also have that kind of impact because young people always ask themselves about the contradictions around them and they want answers. You know, they want answers. And we are in a good space right now, uh, ma mainly for one reason, the concentration of wealth. Mm -hmm. Here in the United States and in the West and in Africa. So no matter how horrific conditions may be economically in individual African countries, you have an elite that also controls substantial resources, just like here in the West. So here in the West, the word socialism is no longer like a dirty word, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in Africa, maybe the youth have not come to that understanding yet. And that's amazing because the uh, communication media is uh, not as sophisticated as it is in this country. Hmm. So maybe, maybe you won't have to use the word socialism in some places, but you teach them the contradictions. And then when they understand it and embrace it, say, you know what? You know, the solution is actually... There's a word for that, it's socialism, you know? <laughs> Sometimes you have to meet people in the space where they understand. In my okay. class, for example, right here in John Jay, the students don't hear me use the word socialism, but I teach them all the aspects. I show them the contradiction. I show them why the system cannot be sustained throughout the semester. And then they start asking me what to read. And I start guiding them mm -hmm. in what to read. And now that fear, that prejudice has been disappeared because they learned the substance of what it is throughout the semester. And they want more, they want more. And now I guide them to the books to read, you know? And if I'm unleashing, I teach about 80 students each semester. You know, if I'm uplifting, you know, 80 uh, young people's consciousness, you know, you know, I think, that's certainly a step in the right direction. You know. um, we come showing our time, uh, Milton, but um, I just wanted to, I don't want us to leave it out. At, uh, it was a question that was asked in the chat. Are you aware of um, uh, Jeffrey Wright's gold mine in Africa? No. Yeah, the, the actor? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in which country? Yeah. In Ghana? Um, I, I'm not sure what country. Yeah, is. what what country is is the uh, whoever asked the question? Uh, Ricky, right. Ricky, right. Oh, Ricky. Uh, yeah. What what country does uh, the actor Jeffrey Wright have? Uh, does he have? Gold mine? Does he have share? He must be a shareholder with some investors. 
Yeah, I don't uh, think I don't think they'd be able to sell you the entire mine. Right. Well, and, and, and well, let me get to my other point um, is the fact that one of the things that I, I've seen, because I, I still believe that um, um, as much as a lot of us understand about the the um, that, you know, as some people stated in the chat that we can't become um, that we shouldn't become, I should say, um, uh, uh, ex exploited, uh, exploited black capitalists. But um, but I do agree with you, uh, Milton, that um, that we have to provide opportunities uh, for those in the continent and then provide yeah. opportunities for those in the continent. We provide for ourselves. I'm just afraid, really, personally, that a lot of times um, we talk ourselves out of these things, um, yeah. um, you know, and, and the fact that um, uh, it becomes because uh, I've been on right. these situations before where right. um, uh, where we try to. Um, create a community, and um, and then all of a sudden now, it, you know, we yeah. talk ourselves out of it for whatever reason. Right. And somebody and else I, gets and, the opportunity. And I agree with you. And part of the problem, the, the 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 problem is this. And I understand uh, people that make that comment. I understand where they're they're coming from. But uh, here's one thing to ponder. I think African countries were in a unique position to have that radical change, the one-time change uh, in the 1960s when they first won independence. And they had that sentiment, the anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, really, uh, you know, the wind behind their sail, so to speak. And that's why that was a lost moment and a lost opportunity when we had the Kwame Nkrumahs the Julius Nyerere, the Sekuture, the Modibo Keita. And they were all uh, talking and actually trying to implement African socialism, you see? So that was the unique moment to have that revolutionary, pretty much overnight change. That moment was lost in time, you see? So now when we look at the contradictions, we have to come out with a different strategy of engaging that. Nyerere, Muribuketa, Esekuture, they could have discussed among themselves how to integrate their countries, you see? Okay. And the masses would have supported them at that unique time in history, coming out of the legacy of colonialism and, and, and imperialism and wanting to reject all that aspect, right? But now we have a confused continent a continent that is manipulated, that is dominated. None of the academies teach so-called radical politics or economics anymore. So there's a lack of understanding as well. So if you engage them the way that you could have engaged in the 1960s, I don't believe it's going to be that effective. And that's where, if we want to remain relevant, you know, we have to come up with other ways of making it happening, you know? And, yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think that yeah, we should also understand that. Right. I mean, I think I think that we should also understand that a lot of us live already in privileged situations um, mm -hmm. where we can sit back and, and debate how many Absolutely. angles of the pen as opposed to people who are actually scratching, um, you know, a daily, um, trying to scratch a daily living out of it. Right. We have the luxury to debate that. They don't. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I recommend people watch this brief, I think it's about 50 minutes, maybe an hour and 10 minutes. And I think I've mentioned it before. Crisis in the Periphery, Africa and the Caribbean by Walter Rodney. And the brother just breaks it down, you know, uh, in an excellent manner. He shows how the, yes, independence opened that door, but unfortunately now we have the comprador class Mm -hmm. serving the interest of Western Ap capital and the World Bank and the IMF. But then Rodney also said, we often ask, what can we do to rectify the situation? And this is toward the end of his uh, lecture, which is a brilliant lecture. He's one of my favorites of all time, by the way, Walter Rodney. Mm -hmm. He says, we should look at it the other way. Not so much what can we do for them, the people we want to help in Africa. How can we best place them within the condition where they are right now? 
to help themselves. Right. You see? That's right. He says, and he said, and I could be seen as part of the problem because I could be seen as part of the petit bourgeois class mm -hmm. myself. But I want to be a part of that solution as well. And what did Rodney do? That's why when Rodney went back to Guyana, he started the Working People's Alliance. That was the party. So even though he, you know, yes, he had become a part of that other, what could be considered an upper class and intellectual as well, he wanted to be a part of the masses and find the solution together with them. So when we look back at how conditions are in African countries right now, where you have, as I said earlier, the 80% unemployment, where you have people being kicked off the land and all that, before we can engage them in a conversation that would start you know, changing their consciousness, we have to deal with the immediate crisis right now. Right. And the immediate crisis right now is poverty, lack of wealth, and now lack of even land because they're being kicked off, lack of food, and the worst, which is lack of hope. It's lack of hope when you try to cross, cross the Mediterranean, yeah. knowing most likely you're going to end up uh, dying. And I think we're in a position to help change that in Africa. And along the way, we teach them you know, different aspects of consciousness. Yeah, we, we have, there are plenty of us in, in this country who, and, and I think, you know, we did it and didn't even realize we were doing it. Many of us have to commit class suicide. Uh, Ricky Ryan pointed that out. A few people pointed that out in the chat. Um, Walter Rodney absolutely did it. So many yeah. of our revolutionaries did this. And I think we look at it as struggling with the people where we realize, I mean, Fred Hampton did it. <laughs> You, you yep, absolutely. Yeah. We have to commit class suicide. Right. But and I'm, I'm glad you said that. Look at young Fred Hampton. Look how mm -hmm. much he learned yes. intellectually within such a short Such time. a short period of time. That. But yeah. he did it by doing what, again, Kwame Torre said, Coca-Cola uh, uh, markets to us 24-7. Yeah. You did, a child who is barely eight years old knows about Coca-Cola because yeah. they get marketed to by Coca-Cola 24-7. So we yeah. have to engage in political education 24-7. Yeah. Last point before we leave, because we are running up against time. Yeah. There is this uh, piece in uh, the conversation that I want to ask you about. Uh, and I'm hoping that it's true. But, you know, I don't have a whole lot of uh, uh, hope with uh, these kinds of, of things. Supposedly, there is a review of the case of who killed Thomas Sankara. Right. Um, what is going on with this case? And, of course, I'm going to drop this uh, article in the chat for you all so you can review it. What's going on with the case? Is it being reviewed? Are we any closer to... Uh, bringing or finding out who really killed Sankara and doing anything about it? And honestly, does it matter? I think it does matter because, as you know, Sankara is really beloved not only in Africa, but uh, among conscious communities globally as well. Mm -hmm. In that the uh, the model that he... He unleashed in, uh, in in Burkina Faso needs to be repeated and duplicated throughout Africa. You know, so it's important that there be closure, not just to the family of Sankara, but to people of Burkina Faso, but to Africans and conscious people generally. Mm -hmm. That somebody cannot come out there to offer people a solution. Uh, and which is the solution that they take control of their own destiny. And that for teaching that and for demonstrating it, because he practiced what he preached, obviously, right? He lived modestly. He cut his salary. He banned driving around in these Mercedes Benz and all that. When he said, let's build a clinic, he came and participated in building the clinic, build a hospital, same thing, build a school. Same thing, plant trees, same thing, build a railway. He was there rolling up his sleeves every day. So to have a person like this killed 
like a wild animal and his body desecrated mm -hmm. and that there be no accountability? No, that cannot be allowed. So that's why it does matter. It's very important. Mm -hmm. And of course, now the question is, will Ivory Coast ever, ever deport him and re, uh, repatriate him? Now, that is the question. I believe they actually do have an agreement for extradition. But so long as uh, we have a neo-colonial uh, uh, regime in Ivory Coast, that remains doubtful. But in time, that may happen because, as I said, young people all over Africa are becoming much more conscious. They're becoming uh, uh, so-called radicalized, you know, and I don't even know why people use radicalized when people just become alert, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that's it. But that's what they're becoming. And in some, I believe at some point, perhaps not in the very distant future, that uh, they would actually uh, extradite and it would find no place in the world and this is Blaise Campaudo, of course, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who was supposed to be his right-hand man and who was uh, influenced by the French through the Ivory Coast, which at that time was under another puppet, Jofé uh, uh, Buigny. Uh, and that's how they got to Sankara, got to Sankara through Blaise Campaudo mm -hmm. and killed him in the most brutal manner and desecrated the body so that the Bukinabe cannot even go back and... Uh, and pray uh, and commemorate and know that the body of Sankara is that occasion. The same thing they did to, uh, to Patrice Lumumba in Congo, you know, executed yeah. by firing squad. They chopped up his body. Yeah. They crushed the bones and then they dissolved the bones in, uh, in sulfuric acid. Utter barbarism. So, mm -hmm. yes, I want him to be extradited and I want him to. Uh, face justice so that there's some closure in this, you know. And I've spoken with his uh, uh, his uh, brother, his younger brother, mm -hmm. a couple of times on this issue. Uh, and uh, yeah, I believe he, he lives in Washington, actually, D.C. Really? So, uh, oh, yeah. So I'm sure he would like to see some closure as well. You should yeah. uh, probably, uh, uh, I think the, uh, I wonder whether his birthday is coming up soon in June. I'm not sure. But maybe at some point you can uh, have that uh, conversation with the brother as well. We would absolutely love to. And I'm mm -hmm. sure that we would, we and our viewers here in Black Power Media would enjoy it as much as everyone enjoys when you come on, yes. Milton. Oh, definitely. I I'll think make, everyone I'll, make sure, I'll make sure you get in touch with him. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone waits. We all wait like 28 days, 29 days, 30 <laughs> days until Milton's going to be on next. And because we wonder what we're going to talk about. We never have enough time to get into everything that we want to talk mm -hmm. about. But every time we have you on, we have the best comments and engagement in the chat. Mm -hmm. People are dropping mm -hmm. book recommendations and we mm -hmm. love the uh, resources that you give us and we drop them in the chat. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. And I really want to shout out Mr. Uganda in the yes. chat who said that he accidentally stumbled on this channel. Didn't even know about, about Black Power Media. Stumbled on this live stream, liked yeah. what he saw, enjoyed the discussion, and uh, he uh, threw us a 10-pound sticky, which I think is about 20-some dollars in U.S. Uh, uh, you know, Mr. Uganja, thank you Sarah, so much. Join Black Power Media. Definitely subscribe. Tell your friends about it. Yeah. And uh, Milton, once again, yeah. thank you. We need so we need much. to get sisters and brothers from South Africa involved as well. So yes, yeah, we need oh, to. Yeah. Uh, we got we got uh, a lot of work to do. We've got a uh, lot of work to do. So right. so let's make this date our next episode of Imprint uh, of Imperialism will be on the struggle in South Africa right now. There, so how, there you go. How about I'm, that? I'm on board. <laughs> All right. So listen, y'all. Okay. Thank you so much for thank you. viewing. Uh, thank you, Milton, for joining us again. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Milton. I appreciate <laughs> it. Okay. All yeah. right. Stay strong. All, all right. And peace to all, all right. of you in Black Power Media. As the eternal chairman, Fred Hampton, always says, I say to you, peace, if you're willing to fight for it. And we have to fight for it, y'all. Stay tuned for the last dope intellectual. Good night.
I had a mark line before I dial up. How they came and they on top and I'm a mile up. I had a mark line before I dial up. How they came and they on top and I'm a mile up. Uh, I know the walls closing in. Don't you dare give up now. Hope believed in me, pull up, do some bucks down. Tied till the valet pull the truck round. Push the line after we drew it, it's just us now. Would you believe me if I told you my granny told me she prayed this? Then booked the surgery just to pull me out of the basement. Right back where I started, nothing to show for a facelift. Got pushed playing Walter White and Davis, never felt so dangerous. The type of power they can't quantify. And name the best from my region, you got a other mind. Think of who really putting on, you never come to mind. Rapping like your Spotify tap, you rappers compromise. Yeah, no need to panic, just paint the canvas If you can feel the static, it's too close, find your balance Embed the revolution for they prohibition bandwidth Blood trickle from the lead to see what's planning I had a mark line before I died.